everybody. Uh, my name is Rob. I'm a heroin addict, alcoholic, um, everything addict. Um, full disclosure is uh, I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, when I got sober 11 years ago, there was no HA around and, uh, you know, uh, and alcohol was my first and my last love. Um, but in the middle there, there was um, some years of heroin that, you know, if I'm being completely honest is, you know, of all the things heroin was my, my true love, you know. Um, so, you know, I'll start from the beginning. Uh, I grew up in a broken family. It was not, you know, anything too crazy. I wasn't really abused. Um, I had a pretty normal upbringing, um, you know, besides the fact that, uh, you know, my dad is an alcoholic and, uh, you know, he's still, um, he's still dying of this disease today. He's still out there drinking. He's had cirrhosis for, probably 15 years and uh, honestly I have no clue how he's still alive but he keeps on kicking so um you know and that was never um that was never really even with his drinking and stuff is is I didn't I didn't see him a whole lot but it wasn't this thing I wasn't you know abused in any way or neglected in any way um you know I always had things that I needed um but as a kid, there was this, um, there was, there was stuff going on inside of me that I didn't really, uh, I didn't really know what it was. You know, I, every, everywhere I went, um, I compared myself to people. I always, you know, I, I look at somebody and say I'm either less or more than them. And, and usually it was less. Um, and, uh. It didn't matter what clothes I had on, how much money I had in my pocket is, I just, I think that I, a lot of times felt less than people. And, um, and, uh, so, you know, growing up, I just always had this, this thing inside of me and, you know, with an alcoholic father, I was always warned, uh, you know, to be careful with, um, you know, with drinking and drugs as I get older. And um, I grew up in New Mexico and it, it, you know, it wasn't a horrible neighborhood, but it certainly wasn't good. And uh, everybody, all the older kids I knew, and also majority of people's parents, you know, they, they drank and they smoked pot. And uh, so to me, that wasn't really that big a deal. It, it was everywhere and, and before I even picked anything up, I kind of knew it was like, well, you know, you grow up and, and that's what you do. And then, but you don't do, you know, <clears throat> you don't do other drugs, you know, but, um, so I remember the very first time I had an opportunity, um, to, to smoke some weed. And, uh, you know, I remember it very thoroughly. A friend of mine, I don't know, we were probably 11, 12 years old or something like that. And, my buddy found, you know, what was essentially an empty bag of weed that was his dad's. There was a little bit left in the bottom and he brought it and it was me and two of my other friends. And, and I looked at it and I like automatically, I've never done this before. And I look at it and I know I'm like, that's not enough. You know, I was like, no, I didn't even want to do it. I was like, that's not enough, you know? And, uh, and so it wasn't long after that, you know, I, I tried smoking pot and, uh, and it was amazing, you know, all those feelings that I grew up with that I was less than, you know, went away. I just didn't care. It, it quieted all of that. And, um, you know, it was, it was really great. And it wasn't long after that, that, you know, I got, I got drunk for my first time. Um, you know, I never, I don't think I ever had a regular drink from the very first time I drank, I blacked out, um, which was majority of the time for the rest of my life. Um, and, uh, so it was, it was truly was my first drunk was I had, I have a sister who's four years older than me, you know, and she is not alcoholic. Well, it's questionable now, but, um, you know, she's also a mom. So, uh, she drinks a lot of wine, but, uh, you know, 
at the time she was she was a senior in high school and she's supposed to be at this point you know experimenting with drinking she's going to senior parties i'm in eighth grade and me and my sister were truly better friends than siblings you know um we were really close we'd no matter where we went we were like a week at my mom's a week at my dad's but no matter what we were always together so we were just we were really good friends and we knew that we were there for each other no matter what and um so you know she used to take me out partying and I, i'm in eighth grade and uh you know she's with all of her friends as soon as we get to this party she leaves i don't see her again for the rest of the night and there's a keg there and people are smoking pot and i just i get smashed and all of those feelings right i'm with these older kids and uh i, I just i want to be cool i want to fit in i don't want to have these feelings of people don't like me or what are they thinking or am i dressed right or you know whatever and I get there, I start drinking and all that goes away. And I'm in a world, I don't know what was really going on, but in my world, everybody liked me, you know? And it was just such a great feeling. Um, within a couple hours, you know, my first time drinking, I didn't know how to do it right. So I just drank, 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 till I blacked out, threw up, you know? And I, I remember the next morning, just really thinking to myself like, all right, I gotta learn how to do this correctly, you know? Like, cause that was really great. And uh, if I could just learn how to do it correctly, um, this is, that was a great feeling and I wanna feel like that as much as possible. And uh, you know, so going back to when I was a little kid and you know, you, you grow up and, and you smoke pot and you drink, right? But you don't do any other drugs. Um, you know, by the time I'm a freshman, I'm, I'm doing coke, you know, that was pretty cool. I do it on the weekends and, you know, try to be cool and sell it. And, and you know, I, and then that's, that's where I drew the line in the sand. All right, Coke, you know, that's it. And it's like a couple months later, I'm, I s smoke some crack, right? And it's like, oh, that wasn't too bad, you know? And, uh, but that's where I draw the line in the sand, you know? And then it's the next thing and the next thing. And I think uh, it's probably like 17 the first time, you know, even all those things that I did, it was like, but never heroin, never, ever heroin. And uh, I was probably like 17 years old. And, um, you know, where, where I grew up, you know, I, I've, I moved here and got sober pretty quick. So I never had a chance to do heroin here. But where, where I'm from is it's black tar heroin. And uh, I remember like just knowing I will not do heroin and it was like, I was 17 years old, I think. And uh, it took nothing. It took somebody saying, hey, I have some heroin. Do you want to try some? I was like, yep. <laughs> I don't know where all that willpower went that I was like, I will never do that, you know? And I did it and it felt pretty good, you know? And I think what really got me was that I had this image of heroin that it was like, just so bad, right? Like you, you grow up and it's like drugs are so bad and they show the guy, the drug addict and the egg frying saying it's your brain and all this. And it was like, well, that, that didn't happen at all. So, you know, <laughs> it was like, okay, that wasn't that bad. I don't know what everybody's deal is, but everybody should be doing this. <laughs> and, uh, and it was like, okay, that was pretty cool. And then like a couple days later, it was like, I think I'll maybe do some of that again, you know? And I got some more. And then, you know, there was no days in between and it was literally within a couple weeks, you know, I'm sure this is everybody's experience, but it's like, like, I'm just not feeling that good. You know, and it's like, I intuitively knew it was like, you know, I bet you heroin will make me feel better. And then it, that was it. It was like, oh, okay, that's where the sickness is from. And also that's how I cure it, you know, and my life turned into that every single day. Um, for, I don't know, three, four years. Um, within, you know, six months, I had no job. I had no place to stay. I had no money, you know, in, within like a year, nobody wanted to talk to me anymore. And all this time, you know, you know, within a year, I'm like homeless. I'm like 18, 19 years old at this time. And I'm like, I'm homeless on the street. And it's every day I'm stealing, I'm manipulating, 
I'm going to my sister who's like, you know, my best friend and I'm saying, I'm trying to get help, please. You know, it's $20 to go to the methadone clinic and, and you know, manipulating her to give me some money and, you know, it's, it's how we do it, you know? And, uh, and all the while is like in my head, I'm telling myself, it's like, I'll, I'm gonna stop this at some point, you know? It's like, I'm not gonna just live the rest of my life like this. And I just truly couldn't see I could not see uh, truly what I was like, like visually. If I could see like what my mom saw, that is not at all what I saw. I saw that as like, this is what I want to be doing right now. Like this is what 18, 19 year olds are doing. Meanwhile, this is not what 18 and 19 year olds are doing. You know, other 18, 19 year olds are going off to college and, you know, starting their careers and maybe, you know, where I grew up, most of them already had a family by that point, but... Um, you know, so I just didn't, I was totally delusional in the fact that I was a heroin addict. You know, I was like, I am not a heroin addict. I do heroin every single day, but I am not a heroin addict, you know? And, uh, it, it's shortly, shortly after that, it was like, I realized, um, I had this short, short bout with cancer and, um, I had to go in for a surgery and then I had to be hospitalized for two weeks after that. And, you know, they were sedating me and the sedation uh, drugs were not working, you know? And I, I, got out of, um, I got out of surgery and they had me on, you know, mass amounts. You know, my mom was telling me like, he's a heroin addict, he needs, he needs more. And they were giving me the legal amount of morphine that they possibly could. And I could feel every single thing. And I was, I was in the hospital for two weeks, right? And I said, all right, like, I'm gonna use this morphine to like wean off the heroin and all this stuff. And it was like, even the week I, I, I got out and I was bed bound for a week even after the hospital. And as soon as I got out, I was like, I was out with like this open wound. They literally cut me open from top to bottom with staples in my stomach. And I'm out there walking the streets trying to get heroin. And it was at that point, I was like, holy shit, man, this has really got me, you know? And, and I really felt at that point, it was kind of too late. I didn't know what to do. And, um, you know, eventually I, I blamed it on the area and I, I called my mom and I, she lived in Las Vegas at the time. And, and I said, you know, I, I gotta get out of here. Like, um, you know, this place is infested with drugs and if I could just leave here, I would be totally fine. And, um, you know, and so she said, all right, like, come out here, we'll get you some help, this and that. And, and I, I went out there and, and I went to a detox and I left, <laughs> uh, God, I was so bad. I, I jumped the fence and tried to steal one of the physician's cars and, uh, and ended up in jail. Like, and, and I've been in Las Vegas for like 48 hours or less and I'm already in jail. And so it was like, and this just was like all the time occurrences, right? And it was like, I'd get out, I'd go into jail for 30, 60, 90 days, you know, whatever. And it was like, every time I went to jail, I'm like, this is my opportunity. I'm never going to put my body through that. I'd withdraw and detox and all this stuff. And it was literally like, I would promised myself like, okay, now's the time. And as soon as they would call my name to be released, I would get out there and call, call the dealer and get high. And uh, this happened for a few more years and, and eventually, uh, you know, they got tired of me going in and out of jail and they, they ended up sending me away for longer than the, you know, I ended up going away for like two and a half years. And, uh, and that, that truly was like my last bout with heroin. And, um, you know, it's, I tell this story, this is how I, this is how I detoxed in jail is I, uh, I swallowed a bunch of heroin while I was getting arrested. It was in balloons. I wanted to get the heroin out. So I decided to go shit in the showers and get it. And what they thought is that I was having, that I was a maniac. So they, put me in the psych ward um, because they thought I was just playing with my shit. And uh, come to find out, they found out that 
there was heroin in there and, and and I'm naked in a psych ward detoxing on a steel bench with no blanket, no nothing, with a shitter that doesn't flush. And it was literally like, I, I like I think about it now and I just could not handle anything even remotely close to that. And, and I also think about it that that was truly an experience for me you know, they talk, they talk about it in, in the big book is like, this is an experience you must not miss, you know, and it like, that was an experience that for me, I couldn't miss that. That was, that was part of my bottom for heroin, you know, and that was, that was the last time I did heroin. I, I ended up doing two and a half years and, uh, you know, like the good addict alcoholic that I am is like, all right, you know, two and a half years, I feel great. I got some weight back on me. I am not going to do drugs anymore. And I got out and I started drinking, you know, and it's like drinking, drinking never sent me to prison. Drinking never landed me in a psych ward in a jail for playing with my shit. You know, I was like, <laughs> all right, I'm good. You know, and it was like 30 days later, I'm back in jail for a DWI, you know, and I, and I don't stop and I'm drinking. Now I'm just drinking around the clock instead of doing heroin around the clock. And, um, I had an opportunity to move out here to New York and I came out here and, and I moved in um, with a family member and he, he, you know, he said under, under the um, condition, you're not going to drink or use drugs. And I said, yeah, all right, I can do that. I had no intention of stopping and drinking, but um, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm 22, 23, something at this point. And I am, uh, I'm closet drinking for like a couple months, you know, I, I wait till he goes to bed and I drink. Sometimes he'd like go out of town. I drink on the weekends, get smashed. And uh, so this whole time he doesn't think I'm drinking it. After a couple months, you know, he knows nothing about this addiction stuff. And he said, you know what, I don't, you know, everybody said you're some maniac and you know, you haven't drinking in two months, you know? He's like, you're a grown man, do what you want. If you want to drink, drink, you know? And uh, that was all I needed. And um, I went out, I actually, um, uh, part of the condition of my parole was to do treatment. And I was, I was in new choices at the, at the old, um, where it used to be. And, and I went across the street and, uh, to Katie O'Burns and, uh, I'm still new to the area. So I have no idea that it's a cop bar, you know, and I, and I'm drinking in there and, at some point, you know, I decided to leave probably because I didn't have any money left and, and I totaled my truck on Union Street and uh, it, it wouldn't go anymore and I'm blacked out and I'm, I'm bleeding because the airbag went off and I'm sitting on the side of the road and I, you know what, it was like at that point I realized like, shit, man, I can't even drink safely. Like, I'm already on parole. I'm like, I literally have not been off of paper or incarcerated in my whole adult life. And like, here I am again in a new place in New York and I'm just doing the same shit. And I was like, you know, the DWI was like not, you know, in comparison to, you know, what the rest of my rap sheet looked like, wasn't a big deal, but I was just like, I was done, man. That was it. That was truly, truly it. And, um, and I met a guy like a week prior to that who, who was an Alcoholics Anonymous. And he had like 15 years sober and offered to take me to a meeting. And, uh, and at that point, I declined. They said, nah, you know, I appreciate it, but I, I was a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. And uh, so that morning, I, I, after getting out of jail, I called this guy and I, he said, all right, let's go to a meeting. And, and I went to a meeting and I got to be honest, I didn't get shit out of it. And I, I was like, I, I am way worse than anyone in this room. Like, there's no way you guys talking about God and the steps and all this. Like, I, like I've been to detoxes, jails, prisons, you know, psych wards, all this shit, right? It's like, what is this going to do for me, you know? And uh, I don't know what it was, man. This is where my higher power kind of came in. Is like, I decided to just keep going. You know, I was new to the area. I didn't have anything to do. I knew that I didn't want to be drinking anymore. Um, I didn't necessarily know how to not drink, but I kept going to meetings and eventually I, I, I kind of got it with, there was, I went to a meeting where there was a, a speaker and he, he 
talked a lot about like the shit that I went through, you know, and I was like, all right, like this is, this is relatable. And, uh, and then he also talked about God and the steps and all this. And it was like, that's where I was like, uh, I don't know, maybe not, you know? And, uh, and sure enough, you know, I, I found, I found a meeting that was very, uh, solution based. I started going to a big book meeting and it was a bunch of old people and, but it was truly awesome, man. It was like, they knew, they talked about what it was like and then how like this book right here and what they did in this book changed them so that they don't have to be like that anymore. And, uh, I had a guy, um, kind of, he didn't appoint himself, but I did not ask him to be my sponsor. Uh, he offered if I was interested in doing the work and I, I said, yeah. And I think even at that point, I wasn't really sure that this is what I wanted to do, you know, long term. And, uh, this guy like brought me into his house once a week with his wife and his kids and his dog. And I hadn't been in somebody's house where they didn't hide the valuables since I was a teenager, you know, and he wanted nothing back. And we went through the steps and we couldn't be more different. You know, I was like, you know, he was kind of hippie-ish and I was not. <laughs> um, it, you know, our stories didn't align, but the thing was is we had the thing in common. The only thing in common that really matters is, is that once we put this stuff in our body, we can't stop. And usually without a solution, I can't stop even when it's not in my body. It's all I can think about, you know? And, um, and he told me how he did it, you know? And we, and we went through this book once a week and, um, we went, we went through all the steps and it, you know, it probably took six, seven months and, and it was amazing, you know? And like, like, I remember getting like 30 days, you know, and being like, holy crap, Dad, I've never done that in my life without being behind bars. And I remember hitting one year. Mm -hmm. One year, because I, I remember coming in and people that were celebrating a year, and I was like, you're fucking showing off, man. Like, you proved your point, all right? You went a year, you know? And and I remember getting a year, and I was like, holy shit, man. My, and, and the dramatic change within one year was huge. And uh, some of the, the gifts that I've gotten, right, is like, for my one-year anniversary, my mom, my sister, my brother-in-law, four, four people flew out to surprise me at the at the Friday night meeting that I celebrated at. They walked into the meeting. I was like, holy shit, man. Like they flew across the country. And it was it, it was like it was truly really great. And also is this realization that is like, you know, that you don't realize how bad you are until everybody's so fucking grateful that you stopped, you know? And um and I, I did a lot, a lot of damage when I was out there and um, going through these steps and really trying to repair that damage was was amazing, right? Because what happened when I went through the steps was, you know, what I talked about when I was really little and is like, I'm c comparing myself and do I, do I add up to people and, you know, what are they thinking about me, right? It's like, I use drugs to get that to calm down, right? And when I went through the steps is like, I was able to get rid of that stuff from doing these steps and like getting a higher power. And, and you know, I know that that's, it's really like the higher power thing is, is really hard for me. And I, I think a lot of people and, you know, so I like to talk about my higher power, which is truly for me is just like, I, I, I just, it's like a sense of that every, as long as I keep doing good, everything's going to be okay. As long as I don't pick up, everything's going to be okay. As long as I try to help the next person, everything's going to be okay. You know, it's very like karma based. I don't, I don't have a name for it. I don't say certain prayers. Um, I just truly believe that if I keep doing the right thing, everything's going to be okay. You know, and what okay looks like is not up to me. Okay can be, jobless it could mean my wife leaving me it could mean you know it, really anything but really as long as i don't pick up everything is tr i i am going to be okay right and that's truly kind of what my higher power and my belief system looks like so 
um, you know, I hope nobody's struggling with, you know, this, this higher power thing, but just keep it simple. That's, that's what works for me is keeping it simple because I overcomplicate shit. Um, you know, so I'll just, I'll wrap it up, but um, I truly am grateful for being asked to come speak here. Uh, like I said, I, I've been sober for over 11 years and like this never gets old. Um, I try and go speak at jails. Um, I'm now about to start um, a tradition study with a, a group of guys. Um, I've taken a lot of guys through the steps. Um, currently I'm not. Um, I've went through the steps a handful of times. And I gotta be honest, is like, this is no longer about staying clean for me. This is, this is about being a good person and living my life so that those voices that I heard when I was a kid telling me I'm not shit so that they don't come back, which would probably drive me to use again. But for right now, it's just about helping people and like me being happy in my life, right? Because, you know, being sober sucks if you're not happy. I'd just rather use, you know, but, um, you know, so I'm truly grateful to be here tonight. And um, yeah, it's awesome. Thanks. Thanks for